nothing beats the joy a puppy can bring to your life. Whether you already have a new puppy or you're in the process of choosing one, finding the right advice can be hard. But with guidance from our team of experts, we'll look at all aspects of this breed. You'll gain useful insights from our dog behaviourist. A whole range of problems which can occur when the breed's needs are not met. Valuable tips from our breed expert. As with toilet training your puppy, consistency is the most important thing. And professional veterinary advice. Sometimes too enthusiastic throwing of balls can lead sometimes in later life to wear and tear on the joints. With their combined expertise, you'll gain a comprehensive understanding of this wonderful breed. Spaniels were thought to have been originally introduced by the Romans. The Cavalier King Charles gained prominence during the reign of Charles II, who was known as the Cavalier. He had a large number of the little toy Spaniels that followed him everywhere. When William of Orange took the throne, he preferred breeds such as the short-nosed pug, and their characteristics were passed down to the existing court spaniels. This resulted in the breed known as the English toy spaniel, but consequently the toy spaniels seen during Charles II's reign were all but extinct by the mid-1920s. An American called Roswell Eldridge offered a prize in the 1920s at Crufts to whoever could recreate one of the long-nosed spaniels that he'd seen in paintings of England's royal families. A small group of English breeders took up the challenge and led by Mrs. Amos Pitt successfully produced the old type of toy spaniel and in 1928 the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel Club was formed. Today they have become one of the most popular toy breeds renowned for being a fearless, lively little dog with a very cheerful disposition. A badly behaved dog can be a misery for all, but with the right guidance it doesn't have to be that way. With sound advice from Claire, an animal behaviourist, you'll be shown the right steps to ensure your pet grows up to become a well-adjusted, happy member of the family. So what motivated Claire to become an animal behaviourist? My first interest in animals started because I was surrounded by animals when I was growing up. Every pet under the sun, um, working croft, so lots of working sheep dogs, we had rescue terriers, um, Labradors around the house. Um, and then I went on to study zoology just to uh, further that interest and my interest in behaviour became evident during the zoology degree and so I went on to study applied animal behaviour and welfare. Um, I then worked with the behaviourist, work with um, pet owners, rescue dogs, um, hearing dogs for deaf people and now I work just specifically with owners um, trying to help them with their problem pets. As a behaviourist I'd always recommend that owners experiencing problems with their pets go to the vets as a first step um, as many behaviour problems are actually caused by an underlying medical problem. If your dog gets the all clear, then you'll be referred to an accredited behaviourist who will help you through the problem. Cavaliers are lovely, energetic, fun little dogs who do make great pets for families. Um, they enjoy playing with children, being petted, um, being soothed on your lap, and um, do make good pets um, with training. They are intelligent, despite what some people say, and um, have actually made very good assistance dogs in some cases. They are fun and exuberant when they play with children which makes them great for small, for small kids and generally their temperament is well balanced. If understimulated however cavaliers um, can be prone to bark um, and you may have some um, trouble with your neighbours as your cavalier chases down the garden barking up the fence. Um, they also may be prone to chasing small animals such as birds, rabbits, cats, that kind of thing. So good training is essential. Also, those that are under-socialised can develop fear-based problems and can be very timid towards people, which is obviously not something you want if you have a cavalier as a pet in a family. So I suggest that all owners of cavaliers take them to puppy classes early on, socialise them well, and they will no doubt make a great family pet.
Socialisation should start ideally with the breeder, but definitely when you take the puppy home. When they're very young, they're very sensitive to learning about new um, people, objects, events, and so you really need to take advantage of that whilst they're young. Um, expose them to all sorts of different people, um, ages, looks, um, clothing, take them to different places, you can carry them if they're too young to walk around, you need to meet other animals, other dogs, everything you can think of that your dog might experience in its entire lifetime, you need to actually get going in those first few weeks. Obviously you don't want to overwhelm your puppy because they are babies and the world is quite scary and quite interesting, but um, if you make them enjoyable and make those experiences enjoyable by providing treats, games and just taking it slowly then they should learn absorbing all, all the information and then later on this, you know, the problems are much reduced. Problems that occur when a puppy hasn't been socialized um, do vary but generally they can be very fearful um, of people or of dogs which of course can lead to aggression problems or um, dogs running away to escape. We have problems with Dogs not are understanding how to play, so they're very exuberant and they actually annoy other dogs at the park because they're running on, they trample over them, which upsets the dog, upsets the other owners and can be quite upsetting for the owner themselves. Um, generally, sound phobias, if a puppy hasn't experienced lots of noises like traffic or washing machines, all the sort of general household noises, they can be quite traumatic and can lead to further problems later on. But generally, um, if you expose your puppy to lots of things, relate it to games, rewards, fun times, they feel very confident, they feel um, easy and relaxed when they later experience them and generally it just makes the dog a happier dog later on. When the owners take their puppies home, they often agonise about when's the best time to actually start socialising um, due to vaccination timings, etc. The best thing is to always take your vet's advice, um, but generally um, puppies can mix with vaccinated dogs. Say your family already has a dog, then it's completely vaccinated and healthy, then it's generally fine to mix the puppy. Um, you can take your puppy outside to meet other people but carry him until the second vaccination has been done. But generally always seek your vet's advice before taking your puppy anywhere and they will tell you when the best time to start puppy classes is. Puppy classes are a really good idea, it's a really great way of socialising your puppy and training them at the same time. Because puppies are so um, open to learning when they're very small. I mean, they're like a big sponge. They're absorbing lots of information about the world and how to interact. It's a great time to actually take them and introduce them to training. A puppy class should be a fun place, a positive place, uh, where they can actually enjoy training and learning about how to interact with other people and other puppies. The best classes are relaxed. They have limited numbers of puppies, perhaps eight to ten puppies maximum. Um, should be a reasonably sized haul and lots of positive methods should be used. If the puppies are allowed off during playtime, it should be controlled so that no puppy learns to be a bully or to be bullied by other puppies. So a nice controlled session. And if there's any concerns about any classes, then you should just go in without your puppy and watch. And if you feel happy, then take your puppy along. But generally, there's, we know too much about dog behavior and training now for there to be any need to use harsh methods, especially with these small puppies. Um, so we do need to find, and it's easy to find, classes that use positive methods. Good puppy classes will use methods such as using reward-based training with the puppy's uh, food or treats. Um, puppies learn from experience and so if they do something or do a behaviour and it is rewarded with a treat, then they're sensible and they will repeat that behaviour again. If the owner doesn't reward them or actually punishes them, then they tend not to do that again. They're sensible puppies. Um, so in class, a good class will use um, the owner's body language to encourage the puppy to get into position um, using hand signals and friendly gestures and they will use a treat the exact moment the puppy does the behaviour. For example, if the puppy's bottom touches the ground, the treat, that's a great, that's a sit. Um, the reward as soon as the puppy lies down. When they're teaching the puppy to come when called, they give a reward at the end just to make the puppy understand that coming back to the owner is actually worthwhile. Um, 
And it is quite hard. The owner has to compete with all the smells and the other dogs and everything else that goes on in the world. So it's hard work at first, but once the puppies learn that being with the owner and working for the owner is rewarding, then it's easy. Now let's meet Alex, a championship judge with years of experience. Years ago, I saw Alan's Mirror Aquarius go best in show at Crufts. And I was actually there because I lived down the road from Olympia, it was held at the time. And uh, I went up and stroked him while all the cameras were on him and I fell in love with the breed from then on. And we actually bought one in 1974 and uh, started from there. But I did buy her from a puppy farm, which I didn't realise the implications at that time. But we were lucky with her and she lived to be 15 which is a, you know, a good age. Uh, after that, I bought one from a proper breeder and then started to show. I walked into my local news agents by mistake. They had got in a dog world, so I bought it and there was a list of all the shows in there. And we started to show at that point. And consequently, we've gone on and on, we've got this chap. who was the top winning dog last year and hopefully will be for this year. The most redeeming feature of a Cavalier is their eyes. They're large, they should be large and dark and round. He's got exceptionally good eyes. Um, their other feature is their waggy tail. They should have a waggy tail. The most important thing is a gentle temperament. The true character of the Cavalier is that they are happy, fearless, people-loving. They're very good-tempered. They should not be aggressive, especially with other dogs. They're not generally a yappy breed, but they can obviously bark like most dogs can bark. Um, they love people. They'd be happy in a situation with a family or they'd be happy with a person on their own. Uh, they're good flat dogs, providing they've, you know, they get their exercise, so they're quite comfortable living in a flat. And they'll take as much or as little exercise as you want to give them so if you're a person that walks five miles a day they'll do that and if you're somebody who just wants to walk around the block twice a day they'd be happy doing that providing they've got human company they're not a dog to be left on their own all day they just love people and they're good with children and they are good with other dogs they're absolutely fabulous in any situation they are really tuned into their own comfort and this is a true story of a girl who bought a puppy and took it home and put it in the kitchen that night and it was crying half the night. So she got up in the night and sat in the kitchen with the puppy and then eventually she fell asleep on the floor. She woke up freezing cold about five in the morning and went to try and find the puppy who was asleep curled up on her pillow on her bed. That really sums up the Cavalier. The advice I'd give to somebody looking to buy a Cavalier is firstly to make sure that it's the right dog for them. Um, secondly, to make sure that they are not at work all day because any dog, whether it be a Cavalier, as nice as they are, will rip the place to shreds. And how can you possibly house train a puppy if you're not there to house train it? They do molt. So you've got, if you're very house proud, then you'd be better to buy a non-malting breed. And then I would uh, contact various breeders, maybe go to some dog shows or the, the Cavalier Clubs do run seminars and maybe attend a couple of those so that you can speak to breeders and see people there and see some of the dogs there. And then you could find out whether or not the breed is suitable for you and that the sort of environment that the puppy's brought up in is exactly what it should be. I certainly wouldn't advocate going to pet shops or puppy farms where uh, uh, an establishment where there are multiple breeds on sale and that where the breeds are kept outside. The pref preferably what you want is a home reared puppy that's brought up in a home environment and that's a well adjusted puppy and that's used to people with a proper diet and proper mental stimulation. Don't be disappointed if a really good breeder will not let you have the pick of the litter 
because most breeders breed for show, not for profit. If I was looking for a puppy, I would want to deal with a breeder who was very helpful on the phone and not just after selling whatever puppy they've got. I would want them to question me extensively and I would expect them to be ex questioned extensively without being taking offence. Um, I would expect them to cover every aspect of the breed and your situation and everything else before they actually got to the price of the puppy. Again, I would expect somebody purchasing a puppy to be to do likewise and ask me lots of questions and the price of the puppy not being of paramount importance. You would be looking for a breeder that doesn't mind you going to look, who has got nothing to hide and that will let you see the, all their dogs as a family and you'll be able to judge then how the dogs are brought up if they jump all over you or if they cower away from you. In a cavalier it's most important that they are the sort that do jump up at you and want you to make a fuss which shows the true character of the breed. The other thing I would be looking for in a good breeder is the fact that they would like to meet the whole family, not just somebody who's purchasing the puppy. Certainly not a breeder who is willing to sell a puppy as a Christmas present, for instance, for a child. Uh, a breeder that would want to meet the whole family, especially the children, and it is important that the children know how to behave with the animals because it's not just for the sake of the family, it's for the sake of the dog as well, and that's the main consideration. Personally, I prefer a dog, and rather than have a bitch spayed, you'd be far better off with a dog because you don't get the same problems, you won't have the problems of seasons, and having to make a decision on, on having the bitch spayed, which will change their coat considerably, they tend to become far more lethargic, and they put on weight, and also with bitches that are spayed, they can have urinary problems such as incontinence through it. So I think if you're looking just for a pet and you're not going to breed, you would be better off just starting off with a dog. Their carrots are lovely um, and they're, to me, they're much more loyal than a bitch. The bitches tend to be a little bit more fickle. The breed actually comes in four colours. One is the Blenheim, which is this colour, which is a rich chestnut marking on a white background. Um, they shouldn't have flecking, it should be good clarity of markings. And then there's the tricolour, um, which is black, brown and white, hence the word tri. And then there is the ruby, which is a completely whole colour, red colour. And then there are the black and tans, which are mainly black, with tan markings on the eyebrows, the cheeks, the front legs and the back legs, and the rest of the body is black. The Cavalier is very good with an other animals. If you have a cat and you introduce a Cavalier to it, it'll learn its place. Um, they're very good with other dogs and very good with other animals. I had a friend of mine that had Cavaliers loose with her rabbit in the kitchen and they got on very well together. So I think the most important thing again is the socialisation aspect and obviously you don't want them off the lead ever when you're walking along the road. They are liable to chase another dog across the road or a cat across the road if they were off the lead. But if you socialise them properly and you have them in a situation where they are with other animals, they are excellent. A good breeder, when you've purchased your puppy, sh should send you away, firstly with a copy of the pedigree, a copy of the litter eye certificate. Not in every case, though, if you've taken your puppy very young, they may not have gone to the ophthalmologist. A sales receipt. If I have their first inoculation done, I always get the vet to do me a letter if, to say that the puppies were healthy, if they were healthy at the time. All puppies are inquisitive and love to get up to mischief. So before you collect your puppy, it's important to puppy-proof your home. 
clear up all small objects that they might choke on. Make sure your garden is secure. That gates close properly. Tidy away loose wires that they could chew on. Install a puppy gate. And don't forget to move your precious ornaments. Taking these simple steps will help you keep your puppy safe from harm. When you get your puppy home, you might find that he's not happy sleeping where you actually want him to sleep for the first night and he might cry. Uh, you have to be strong and then make sure either by giving him a teddy bear or something he can curl up to that he'll be comfortable and just have to close your ears to him crying. The most important thing again is consistency with the puppy. It's no good after the that first night taking him up to your bedroom if you don't want him permanently in your bedroom they need to know exactly what the boundaries are and where you want them to sleep there are many different opinions on the best way to toilet train your puppy but everyone agrees that kindness and not punishment is the most effective method try to take your puppy outside after eating sleeping drinking or playing as this is when they most need to go. Always take your puppy to the same spot each time so familiar smells remind him what he's supposed to be doing. One tried and trusted method is to start by covering a large area with old newspaper. Slowly reduce the area covered and move it closer to the door, eventually moving it right outside. As with toilet training your puppy, consistency is the most important thing because puppies do not know what's acceptable behaviour and unacceptable. They have to be taught. If it's unacceptable when they're in the nest with their mothers, she'll growl at them. I'm not advocating that you growl at your puppy. Don't give the dog an old slipper because the dog will not know that it's an old slipper and the difference between your new brand new slippers that you won't want it to chew. So give it a toy that's actually its own toy that is completely different to anything you own. Um, if you don't want them on the sofa, then don't let them, because it's a cute little puppy, be on the sofa with you and then when it gets to an adult you don't want it on the sofa. You need to be consistent from the start and you do not let it on the sofa. You do not have it in your bedroom if you don't want it in your bedroom. Um, if you want it to toilet train you need to be consistent and not sort of not bothered one time and bothered the next. Consistency is the most important thing with any training of a dog. The socialisation of any dog, is, especially a Cavalier, is very important and they should be socialised with other dogs, taken to training classes. They are not the brightest coin in the box, so they need to be, they respond to training, they like to know where they stand and a socialisation class with other dogs is a very good idea so that you can lay down some boundaries and you know as well as the dog knows exactly what you want from them. The other thing about socialization you don't want them barking at every dog and you don't want them uh, barking at people or children and usually you start them at about four to six months but the other thing to remember is you mustn't be too hard on them and expect them to learn too much too soon. You have to tr think of them as a sort of baby, really, and they'll only take in so much information at, at a time. And some people do expect them to jump through hoops and everything after they've had them a week. You've got to be very patient as well. But the more you socialise them, the better dog you'll have. They must have four meals a day and these to be increased obviously as the puppies grow and then when they get to about 12 weeks you can knock one of the meals off. They usually let you know which meal that they don't want so you can knock that one 
off and just increase the other three. Any kind of well prepared puppy food is acceptable, providing the main important thing is that the puppy gets four meals a day and isn't left all day on its own. How can anybody feed four meals a day if they're at work all day? So that's something that they really must take into consideration. One of the other things you must remember when you have a puppy, it's a fundamental need that they have water down at all times. They must have access to water at all times. You can get lots of good uh, water bowls, spaniel bowls on the market now so they don't even have to get their ears wet and they can have access to water all the time. You just need to make sure it's topped up. I found when feeding my dogs that when I'm changing from puppy foods to adult foods that I do it gradually and then I gradually phase out the puppy food and then they're completely on an adult food. The exercising of Cavalier puppies should not be extensive. You should give them a little bit and maybe two or three times a day but not more than a few hundred yards. If you over exercise them you can well firstly cause them to become very thin and their um, muscle tone goes on their bones. It's much better to wait till they're about six months and then they can take quite a lot of exercise. It's like you wouldn't expect a two or three year old child to run a marathon. It's the same sort of comparison as that. I find that the best way to transport a dog undoubtedly is in a cage. If a car was to hit you then there's no chance that the rear of the car opening up and the dog escaping out onto the main roads as I've heard several times in the past. So the safest way is to transport them in a cage. Make sure that the cage is big enough for the dog and that it's comfortable. Do not let your dog jump straight out of a cage onto the pavement, especially if it's a puppy. They can catch their legs in the cage as they're going out. They can hit the pavement in an awkward way and perhaps even break a leg. You're far better to open the cage door and lift the dog out and put it on the ground. The other thing to be aware of, you must never leave dogs in cars. Even if you think it's really it, it's cool and there's no sun, you must be aware that they can, the heat rises very high quickly in a car and a dog can suffocate. But really you shouldn't leave a dog unattended in a car at all. Cavaliers can be prone to heart disease which is something that most Cavalier owners have got used to living with. It is something you need to can take into consideration. However, the most important thing is their temperament and their upbringing and with the best will in the world there are other factors that cause heart problems other than just breeding. Ideally you should not let your Cavalier be overweight, that can make a, a really big difference to their heart conditions. But preferably, what I, well, what I do with my puppies, if I have their first vaccination done I get the vet to do a letter that I give to the new owners saying that their hearts have been checked. I get him to check their hearts and if they're sound he gives me a letter to say so. There is another condition that um, can occur which is called syringohydromelia. Unfortunately at the moment there is no conclusive test for it so we're still waiting for that to, to happen. Um, it does at the moment affect about 1% of the breed. On average a Cavalier will live between 10 and 15. If you're lucky they can live to be 17. I've heard of one that's lived to 20. But the average general lifespan is between 10 and 15. As regards boarding a Cavalier when you're away, preferably it would be nice if you could either take them back to the breed, although not all breeders are in the situation where they can board for you, but they may be able to recommend somebody for you. Um, if they have to go into kennels, they are very adaptable and they will survive in kennels, although I'm sure that they prefer your bed or, or their own home comforts. But um, they will fit into a kennel situation just for a couple of weeks without too much hardship. The thing I love about the Cavalier is their temperament. 
you cannot be a cavalier for temperament. They are affectionate, they're fun-loving, they'll have as much or as little exercise as you want to give them. They are, may not be the sharpest pencil in the box, but they are just absolutely wonderful. And if you are really lucky, they find their comfort zones anywhere and they'll let you know what they are, what they want and what they don't want. And if you're really lucky, you might find yourself wrapped around their paws. A vet is as important to your dog's health as a doctor is to yours. So let's hear from Brian, who has over 40 years of veterinary experience. The Cavalier, being a small dog and having normally a very good temperament, I think in part is a very ideal and suitable pet for not only families with small children, but also older people as well. The only problem with them, they have a fairly long coat, so they tend to sort of lose hair, but they are generally of a good temperament, normally you know, ideal, loving little dogs. One problem, the one that the Cavalier, Cavalier King Charles Spaniel does suffer from, is the uh, likelihood in middle age or later of developing a congenital heart disorder. And this can cause you know, considerable distress, not only to the dog, but also to the owner, because uh, this is in the form of heart murmurs, a valvular problem with the heart, which then leads to breathing problems and uh, the dog then having to be on medication for, for this condition. Uh, hopefully, you know, this, this, this congenital and hereditary condition can be eliminated by sensible breeding. Other than that, they are a very active little dog. They don't really suffer an awful lot from um, um, congenital problems. Their hips are okay, you know, they will um, take a lot of exercise, they're normally very obedient, and they do make very nice pets. I think the general care of a dog, I think the most important thing, of course, is to first of all find the type of diet that suits the dog, because many dogs do have rather delicate stomachs and therefore are easily upset by certain types of food. Uh, I think also remember that certain breeds do require very much more exercise than others and therefore that's an important factor that uh, problems you get with dogs are often related to the fact that they don't get sufficient exercise. Uh, and thirdly, of course, they should also have routine vaccinations and checkups at their veterinary surgeon to make quite sure that no, no unpleasant or you know, avoidable conditions are developing. I think it's important that people should uh, choose the right type and breed of dog for their own situation. Uh, remember that even all small puppies, which all look adorable and fluffy, sometimes grow into very huge dogs and require an awful lot of expense in maintaining them, require a lot of exercise to keep them fit. And <clears throat> I therefore think it's most important to any owner consulting me about the choice of dog is to seriously consider you know, their own <clears throat> um, way of life in fact and whether that dog will fit into their routine rather than their routine revolving around the dog. Well, I always advise new owners to have the dog at home for probably three or four days just to let it settle in. Um, we then try and determine from what background the puppies come, whether it's come from a private breeder or whether it's come from a pet shop, because uh, obviously that is important, whether it had any vaccinations and also general background. Uh, so after three or four days, we then ask, in fact, new owners to bring the puppy down to the surgery and we then give it a full examination. Um, I think the first important thing is to determine its general health, whether the dog is you know, the correct body weight, <coughs> whether it's got a skin trouble, um, <coughs> whether there's any lameness or abnormality of the legs or bones, eyes are okay, a general health check. Um, invariably most puppies are fit and well. We don't see nearly as much now infectious conditions in puppies as one used to years ago. We check obviously for skin parasites, uh, lice is a factor sometimes we see, or flea infestations, very occasionally mange. Um, I always stress to owners that temperament is most important. You know, that doesn't matter what the dog looks like, the most important thing for a pet dog is a very easy going, uh, easy dog that is the minimum of trouble. And you can often assess the temperament of a dog even when it comes into the surgery for that first visit at eight or nine weeks old. 
Uh, it can be done at any time in its age, whether it's one year or ten years. One advantage of this course is that it does forestall and avoid the uh, development of uh, an infectious condition of the womb called pyometra, which can develop in dogs, in bitches, particularly when they've never had puppies. In male dogs, again, uh, my advice normally is to leave the dog until he's a, probably about a year old. If he is not a problem, uh, then one can certainly leave him again because the, dog, the male dog can be castrated at any age. The normal reason for this, for castrating dogs, is um, you know, if in fact he is a, a wanderer, uh, oversexed, aggressive, uh, marking his territory, all those sort of problems will generally improve with castration. Uh, it's a very straightforward operation, both of them, they're in for the day, uh, an appointment's made at the surgery first thing in the morning and the dogs then go home uh, the same day and normally there's a you know, complete recovery within two to three days of the operation. In some cases it does mean that one has to be much more careful about uh, strict diet control because to do the hormone change in both the male and the female there is sometimes a tendency to put on weight. Well, the most, the old-fashioned way, of course, of attacking the dog was in that literally put an identity disc on the dog's collar. This is still, I think, advisable, although they do tend to sometimes get lost and the collars go missing and so on. Other forms are tattooing in the ear, which is not very frequently done, and the more common method now, and one which we tend to advise, is the microchip. This is a small little chip that's inserted into the, under the skin in the shoulder region. Uh, each chip has an identity individual number so each dog is registered at a central computer with this individual number. This is, a, this is the microchip uh, syringe which introduces the microchip under the animal's skin in the neck region. Uh, the little microchip is contained in that needle barrel uh, which is literally no more than probably like a lead pencil the actual chip itself. Uh, and so really it's a relatively painless procedure, literally done as with an ordinary routine vaccination. And the dog suffers no ill effect or discomfort afterwards. If the dog goes missing, it's then scanned and the number comes up and the owner and address can then be traced. This again is very uh, vital now and obligatory now for animals going abroad, which is increasing now with the relaxation of pet passports. <coughs> dogs now do travel abroad very much more. And all dogs now going uh, <coughs> to the continent or uh, to other regions do now have to be microchipped as a permanent form of identification. In getting a pet passport, this is necessary now to take a dog abroad. Uh, it depends to some extent on which country you're going to. If, for example, you're going to New Zealand or Australia or some of the Scandinavian countries, they do require very uh, detailed and complicated blood tests. But your veterinary surgeon, obviously, uh, in conjunction with, the, with, the, with DEFRA, can give you advice on that. For, more, for nearer tra travelling, for example, on the continent, a pet passport will now suffice for taking a dog abroad. This is obtained um, by, first of all, the dog must be vaccinated against rabies. This is a, a single injection, um, and then after three to four weeks following that injection, uh, the blood dog can then be blood tested, and providing that then illustrates a, you know, an acceptable uh, teeter against rabies, um, within the, you know, the passport can then be issued with the proviso that the dog cannot come back into the country within that six-month period following the blood test. So it's a fairly straightforward procedure. Um, and then that is then renewed every sort of two years with a routine rabies vaccination and the, that then, then continues for the life of the dog. Other countries, or coming back into the country, of course, is in some cases more complicated. Uh, from the continent, of course, there's a set procedure whereby the dog must be treated for ticks and tapeworm within 24 hours of, of leaving the country. Obviously now, with increased transport of animals and dogs, uh, it's a common procedure now for dogs to travel across the continent <coughs> in cars. And remember, of course, in very hot weather, it's important to uh, maintain frequent stops, plenty of, plenty of ventilation, plenty of water, and uh, 
ultimately, I think then the dog should then be none the worse for these for these journeys. In this day and age, the main uh, worry, of course, one has of dogs being injured in car accidents or causing car accidents. And so I think this is probably one of the most frequent injuries that we see in animals, being hit by cars uh, and injuring their legs and, and or even worse conditions. And so we do stress that obviously dogs must be always kept on leads in built up areas. And if they're not trustworthy and therefore not obedient, they obviously must be maintained under full, full control. Uh, I always advise people not to throw sticks for dogs, so this is a common injury that dogs you know, catch a stick in mid-ear or the, dog's in, the stick is impaled in ground, the dog runs into it, and often we see the most horrific injuries to the mouth and neck from impaled sticks. So again, that's another thing one has to watch. Uh, balls, again, have to be careful with balls. Sometimes too enthusiastic throwing of balls can lead sometimes in later life to wear and tear on the joints. One also has to remember, particularly with puppies, they're very inclined to chew things, whether it be rugs or socks or rubber balls or plastic toys uh, or even stones. And therefore one has to be very aware, in, particularly in young dogs and even you know, older dogs, that uh, they don't then swallow something that is then going to cause an obstruction and therefore make the dog then very ill. So one has to be very careful, therefore, in you know, being sure the animal does not um, have access to these sort of things which can chew up and therefore cause an obstruction which will then require abdominal surgery. When it comes to adopting an older dog, this is something I often do advocate because uh, people sometimes don't want the extra hard work and uh, training of a young puppy. And with an older dog, often they make them very good pets and uh, you know, will settle into a new home very easily. Um, a main thing, of course, is I think with an older dog is the reason why it's being rehomed. Is there some you no know, reason for it? In many cases, there are very genuine reason, and the dog you know, makes a very good, very good uh, companion. Grooming isn't just about looking smartly turned out. It's also important for the health and general well-being of your dog. Let's hear from Charmaine, a professional groomer and hydrotherapist. Grooming is very important for your dog, regardless of the breed, regardless of its hair type and hair length, because it gives you a bond, it makes you aware of how its skin is, um, whether there's any problems developing. So regular once a week complete check over from head to toe, starting at the nose, going right through, ears cleaned, checking in the mouth, checking the teeth, going through it with your hands, feeling it, so that when you actually do get a lump or a bump, you know the difference and you know your dog because your hands are on it continually. With regular grooming, your dog should have a healthy skin without blemish, without dandruff, not greasy, not be smelly, because nobody really wants to live with a smelly dog. Dogs which are bath regularly can be done in a milder shampoo, so it won't affect their skin. And then your dog's coat should be shiny, matte free, not free, smelling sweet, and the dog should be looking good. The Cavalier King Charles Spaniel, a very endearing breed, um, absolutely wonderful nature, L love everybody and everything. They're supposed to be untrimmed totally, um, so the work should be quite minimalistic. If they're spayed or castrated, the coats can grow in overdrive where they get incredibly woolly, incredibly long, and then become quite impractical for most pet owners to actually cope with. Being quite low to the ground, they generally pick up lots of burrs and half the garden in their coats when they're out for a walk or let out for a wee, and they can tend to get very wet where their coats are trailing through long grass. Um, we actually get requested to actually do clipping on a lot of cavaliers, which I think a lot of show people <laughs> might be totally against, but what works for the, pet, the average pet owner. They, the degree of trimming for a cavalier can vary and we do whatever basically owners require. Um, it could be a basic comb through, comb through some, and a brush. Some people do like the hairy feet and all the long drang, dangly ears, long tails, long trousers and all the extra long feathering. Other people find that far too much to work with or it actually becomes matted because they haven't got the time if they're working to actually comb the dog daily, which it does require. So we can either thin it and scissor it to make it shorter and a neat appearance or actually use clippers and actually clip down the main body 
um, to actually make the dog um, a lot more neater and more practical to manage. The Cavalier has great big droopy ears which are quite excessively hairy. Um, we need to really thin the underneath or clip off the inside to let the air get in um, otherwise they can be prone to ear problems and quite dirty smelly ears so that's an area which actually needs to be so, um, looked after weekly by being wiped out and cleaned and checked their teeth often get dirty as they're quite small dogs people seem to think they can be fussy eaters and give them mashed up food so they often suffer with quite a lot of tartar on their teeth nails can get very long as they're quite flat footed um, and again, I don't think people actually probably would exercise them as much as the Cavalier would want to be exercised, and their nails can get so excessively long. We have quite a few that come in the grooming parlour where their nails are actually growing round and back into their pads. Um, so that is another area which needs to be looked at. And they have quite excessive hair growth on their feet. For show, this is not supposed to be trimmed off, but for the average pet person, they bring from far too much mud, have the risk of grass seeds between their toes, um, and it's just much easier to manage if their feet are actually trimmed and kept short and their nails are kept nice and short. They can be quite a high maintenance breed um, to look after. As a young cavalier um, and as a puppy, they don't have much coat. The coat definitely comes with age and as the dog gets older. So a two-year-old might not require the same amount of grooming and the same amount of time as it would take to groom a dog which is seven or eight or nine. Hydrotherapy is a complementary therapy where they're to aid vets in their treatment of dogs with various conditions. It's a form of physiotherapy. It's done in warm water, so there's increased circulation of blood supply to all limbs and dysfunctional limbs. So it's very good for paralysed dogs. A lot of dogs which can't actually walk due to spinal problems or neurological problems like CDRM will be able to swim and it's quite nice to see a dog which is brought in on a sling or a support or carried in to actually put it in the water and actually watch it swimming up and down. It helps build muscle which helps keep the dog fitter and ultimately maybe even be able to support its frame and actually stand up. It benefits dogs with joint disorders, elbow problems, hip dysplasia, it helps support the muscle, build muscle, support the joint, keep them supple and mobile Dogs with arthritis benefit because it's a bit like a rusty chain on a bike, a joint which isn't used. It will rust up and seize up and the less you use it, the more painful it becomes to use it and the more it doesn't want to be used. If you use the joints, they become much more supple and you increase the range of movement. So the dog can actually move more, it's easier to move more. When it's in the water, the dog's totally weight free, which is no pressure on any injured limb or joint. We can swim dogs with ligament problems, cruciate problems, which is the knee joint, and some just swim for fun. Some swim because they just enjoy it. We have quite a few Nova Scotia retrievers swimming just because they're water dogs and they just like swimming. For the Others do it for fitness. We have agility dogs which do it for stamina. Greyhounds that swim again for stamina. Others just because their owners want to give the dog some fun and they just enjoy catching toys and swimming up and down. It is a treatment, so swims are tailored to the individual dog's needs. The hardest thing is probably cardiovascularly. A lot of dogs can't actually use their lungs enough to actually be able to swim for long periods of time. So they might start in only doing one minute, and then that will progress to a minute and a half to two minutes, and gradually we get them on sections of doing four minutes, coming out, having a rest, going back in, doing four or six minutes, coming out, having a rest, and going in again. Our pool is a specially designed canine pool which has jets which if you turn them up actually makes the water go faster towards the dog and it ends up a bit like white water rapids and turning up a treadmill very fast so the dog's effectively swimming against high water pressure coming at it and it gives it a much stronger workout so it actually has to breathe harder it's a bit like running so three or four minutes in the pool could be like doing five or six miles on the run so it can be quite a strenuous workout for the dog and it's, we found great benefits for a variety of problems, whether it's hips, heart, it helps with heart murmurs because it strengthens the heart muscle. Um, we thought arthritis is one of the main ones and it's a chance for fun. With its cheerful disposition and steadfast loyalty, it's no wonder that Cavalier King Charles Spaniel continues to be one of the most popular breeds of family dogs.